Welcome back to part two of my chat with the guys from Bamzuki and of course my dad. Now we're going to jump straight into the action. There's no sort of preamble this time, so I hope you enjoy. Mm. Jeremy, I mean, that's a, you've been very patiently listening to the development there. The, the, the process of, of running the business that was trying to keep Bamzuki rolling is where you stepped in, I think, you know, after the, it sounds to me, if we go back in that timeline, that point that Ian gets a phone call from Paul saying, I think I've worked out how to do this on my laptop and Dylan code it. <laughs> is that where, is that where your involvement started? Well, yes. I mean, so, so I met up with Ian, uh, we were introduced by Howard Newmark, who used to work for me. And um, we decided that we would set up a company in Cambridge called Gameware. So via Gameware, uh, we acquired all the assets and IP of Creature Labs, and we took the idea of the uh, the TV show forward uh, with with Gameware as the the commercial vehicle. And was you what was your thinking at the time? Did you see it as turning into a like a Creatures type games license as well as a TV show? Is that was that? Well, I was working with the BBC, so that there was always, um, you know, a, a bit of friction about uh, who owned the intellectual property. But um, yeah, I mean, fairly obviously, we we wanted to to take the franchise, the TV franchise, forward. So that that was always our ambition. But we had no idea that it would be successful, actually. No, of that. course not. I mean, no, no. At, at the outset, it was let's let's do this thing because it's it's leading edge. Nobody's done it before, and it's pretty exciting. And, and, and so, so this is still Gameware was created to make this new TV show effectively. No, Gameware was was set up to um, well basically take advantage of, of uh, the development projects that we had in prospect. I mean, actually, I mean because we came from a games industry background, yeah, you know, we were kind of uh, initially we were more interested in exploiting James Pond and creatures. So you know we. we talked a lot about what we were going to do with the existing IP. Um, I'm so basically, I mean, we were able to still sell creatures products. We actually sold physical box products um, because we had them, we owned them. And so um, uh, that was the logical place to look. But we, we were used to the traditional developer publisher model, whereby we approached the publisher with an idea. They gave us money. We developed the thing, uh, and, and then, with a bit of luck, they paid us a royalty uh, for the launch of the successful product. And that was the way that the industry used to work, that the old model. And that's not how TV works, to, to, to an extent? No, no I mean, I mean TV was, was basically work for hire, so... It was always a work for hire gig, but it was... Well, Mike, that's not strictly true, because I would argue well, you could argue that's a model similar to, I mean, some of the stuff that you you you, you did for, for PACT, I mean, for independence, but that was for independent television production companies. And yeah, yeah, I think yeah. the model wasn't really mature enough in terms of, you know, Not because true. I think the BBC just simply saw uh, the Jeremy Ian and Dylan as just a resource provider, much like you have, uh, I don't know, someone building a set for you or something like that, you know. So and there's actually, a kind of a... There, it's genuinely it why, I, why I went to work for PACT because I saw that problem, which was that the BBC which, uh, and, and broadcasters in general were treating uh, games companies, coders and internet companies effectively as if they were lighting engineers that you could just hire to make a just show. resource providers. And didn't yeah. realize their business model was yeah. the same as TV yeah. production companies, which is you make all your money out the second time you sell it, not the first. Basically. And um, uh, I don't think we, yeah. I still don't think we solved that problem because just at the point that we managed to get them all to agree to that, they stopped making shows like this. this mm. I don't know if well, they. Well, we, <laughs> we were though at the time incredibly lucky because uh, because of the timing of Paul's idea and the phone call and the fact was it was it not also true that you came up with the name bamzuki within about an hour or a day at least bonsai monkey was a name that had come from creature labs it was as dylan said it's the name of the engine and the scripting language yeah so bonsai was the name of the engine and then we'd written a scripting language to control all the behavior and that was monk m-u-n-k-i um, 
Yeah, we'd, and so yeah, the whole the whole thing together was called Bonsai Monkey. And my executive producer, I, I mentioned the name somehow, Bonsai Monkey. She loved it. She thought, God, that's a great name, you know, because the, um, it just had this great feel to it. But I, I went to the guys and said, like, Could we use it for the name? And they were like, They were like, Oh no, for, for whatever reason, probably a good reason, we couldn't. So I spent the entire weekend trying to come up with a name that sounded like Bonsai Monkey, which had a sort of a nice consonant at the end and a sort of vowel at the end. Uh, beginning and end, and um, and I ca and then every time I came up with a word, I put it into Google to see if if anybody had it, and I, I ended up coming up with, uh, with Bamzuki. Uh, and once I got it, then I just said, "Let's go to Bamzuki," and then that was locked. So yeah, we went, and, and the name of we Zeke's went, Zeke's for the creatures so as well. It's a BAI. I think actually that was Caroline Norris actually because when I was producing it because it was the first ever program I produced and I was also going to direct and I and I could tell the people around me were a bit nervous but they were thinking oh my god we must let Paul do it because obviously he'll go mad because he's been working on it for like five years <laughs> and so they assigned a, a sort of a, a parental producer over me a, a very experienced producer called Caroline Norris who poor woman had to sort of sit and sort of uh, hold my hand a bit and find me really annoying because I was so arrogant and and and, uh, and just hell bent on doing it my way. But I think I think she might have been the one when it starts. Yeah. Credit for that. And Jeremy's now built a shrine to Bamzuki. I have a yeah. little shrine. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky him. I've actually got a mint shrine. I've got two awards there. Bamzuki series. I lost three. mine. mine. You realised series one brick. I've got two pictures as well somewhere. But I've only just moved house and I haven't found out where they are yet. If you guys need your pensions topping up, I'm sure the Discord group will bid for those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got one little memento. I've got one thing, which is... What does it mean? That. Do you recognise that, Paul? Oh, uh, yeah, wow. yeah, 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 yeah. So that was... Oh, yeah. That was, we had like in the first series, we had this uh, horrendous, so I mean, we were, this software was like, you know, it had its first sort of trial by fire in the studio. And um, so we had like, there was two, two programmers, three programmers in the studio, like on, on the computers programming while we were trying to uh, oh, that was film. Dave Bowmick and Guy Tristram? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, like, uh, I mean, first of all, it was just um, ironing out all of the uh, all the bugs and stuff that we had, sort of talking to the whole studio um, hardware and getting all of that working. And we had one of the bugs was basically every so often the whole system would just freeze, and uh, all the cameramen would like go they, they, they say the zooks have stopped moving and everything's gone funny. And uh, it took I can't remember how long it took. It took a while to get round to the fixing that problem, but it was a bug. It was a very technical bug deep in the code, but uh, then at the end, Paul gave me uh, this uh, award for uh, bug catching. So <laughs> <it's>, um... <laughs> I take quite... credit for that. I think Sarah Bailey probably did that. I'd like to take right. credit for <laughs> production manager. I, mean, that, I suppose that opens up the, okay, now you, you've got the uh, idea, the name, and you're heading towards the studio to direct and produce your first TV show that you've done both of those things based on an idea you pitched for. How did it, what do you start thinking about turning that into a TV show? What's your... Well, the funny thing was, in a way, I mean, you know, we sort of, uh, it was a sort of, we were able to sort of um, partition because in some ways you just treat it as a standard TV show, uh, which is a game show. And I've been working on game shows and I've been working on the mechanics of game shows. And obviously you, you had to then consider the limitations of the, so of the software that would enable you to do whatever. And, and one of the things I've been very, very strong on, which was, which was hard to, to, to convince people, but they, luckily people, I think they either, they either believed in me or they just gave up because they didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And that was this idea that children would come into a studio with the zooks they'd made at home and we would pr produce contests for them and that they would not control their creatures in the contest like you would normally expect in a game show but they would stand back and they would watch their their creatures compete but the the activeness of the of the the the, the children in the studio was choosing which creature for which contest so there was a kind of a weird thing whereby we were asking children to come into the studio choose their four and then compete against other kids 
and then to sort of basically decide which one to put into which contest, not knowing which contests were coming up. Um, like playing, uh, you know, uh, it's almost uh, like a, a, a dog show. Almost yeah, like a, exactly. You know, and, like and, and knowing that they and have you jump four over two yeah. There's exactly. nothing you can do once you put the dog in the arena, basically. Like. Exactly. So, in, in some ways, the format was very, very simple in that respect. But we wanted to keep it simple. And then, and then, alongside that, we would, I would constantly be. I remember. Dylan and I would often just have Skype just open all the time because he was in Cambridge and I was in the television centre in London and Wood Lane and uh, and we'd just have our Skype open and I would just be sort of he would be uh, you know I sort of probably has a very close relationship with him to to the rest of my family and then and then he was developing all the code to make sure that it all worked and then what we also did which was brilliant and I'm and I, I'm so glad we did is we fostered a really good relationship with BBC Research and Development R and D who were based in Kingswood Warren who just loved it because what they had was they had really clever tech, uh, which they, for, for virtual reality studios, you know, sort of with the, the, the markers on the ceiling and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But they needed showcasing. And what, what we realized was, was that we could showcase their technology really, really well. And that they loved the fact that we were working with it. Who was it on? Danny, was it Danny? Uh, well, no, Danny Popkin was working resources and he was a go between, between Studio production resources and Kings of Warren, but Graham Thomas, Graham Thomas, and then yeah. we had uh, Jigna, I've forgotten his name, it was uh, Mundili, Shak, Shizai, no, it was it Jigna, who, who came as a sort of, uh, she came in, sat in, in our team. So we had this beautiful triangle, oh, I'd say a four way relationship. We had Arsenal's production, we had three, uh, the game where up in Cambridge, we had Kingswood Warren uh, Research and Development. And then we had BBC Studio Resources, and in that relationship, we just we just sort of just moved along towards the the December yeah. Studio recording. No, for me, because Firebox used the same technology, and it was one of those interesting things where you just discovered this piece of tech. That, as I understand it, the, so, so what it, I, I'm not sure it's exactly the same stuff that we used, but it, the trick was trying to work out what the cameras were seeing and where the cameras were in the studio if you moved cameras um, and then relate that to the computer animations that we created. Mm -hmm. And the, what we all discovered was this guy had been working once every four years on a system that allowed them to project uh, a human being into graphics for election time. And literally it had been developed so that they could move a camera around the studio on election night and um, I can't remember the guy that used to wander around waving his arms around pointing at graphs and so on. <laughs> it was designed just Jeremy to do Vine. that. Jeremy, Jeremy Vine. Well, no, before Jeremy, Jeremy Vine. Vine. No, the really, uh, the, the guy who's, yeah, who's son of and, and, and we all looked at, that's it. And we all looked at this technology and said, yeah, shit, that's what we need. That's absolutely <laughs> what we need. And now we can move the cameras because before that in Firebox, certainly we were looking at the fact we'd have to have fixed cameras. Um, and you'd end up with this almost 2D graphic and then as soon as you could move the cameras, that was finished. But again, now you think, and now that's in your phone. <laughs> you can you can now easily move a camera around a virtual object and it's in your front room. Oh, the the eye, eye line was the magic ingredient. Mm. Well, and that's, that's the other thing that you guys solved with Genius, and I don't know who did that, is explain how, what the kids were seeing. Well, what the kids saw was, so So what was, what was crucial for us was we wanted to convey the sense children could see what was happening on the table because they could see nothing because what was being seen on the table was just computer overlay on top of the cameras the cameraman could see it but the kids couldn't so what we did was we strung a very large beam up on the ceiling we projected a top-down view which the, which uh, Dylan's computers just provided as a top-down view of the contest and in the first season what we did was we we just <laughs> we sort of we, we we dimmed it the projector enough so the cameras couldn't see it, but the kids could, and that was really tough because it was because you had very bright studio lighting and it was very difficult to see. But what they did in the second season, which was just genius, and I so loved it, and this was what's so wonderful about working with BBC R and D, was that they they put a shutter, albeit an analog shutter, in front of the projector, and they offset, off phase, out phase, is out phase, off phase the shutter with the camera. So it basically meant that when the projector was projecting onto the table, the cameras were off, and when the cameras were open, then the projector was off. So it was like this, and whilst there was a sort of sine wave, you get a little bit of spillage on the other side, it meant that the kids could actually see more, and that's why 
What the kids are seeing is they're seeing it quite a sort of dull, but good enough representation of the top view of their creature. And that's why they could see where it was. Of course, if the creature was too big, then you'd have a work or whatever it is. You, you would, your eyeline would be slightly out of it. Because everything was really roughly like that sort of size, the eyeline worked, and that was so genius. But, but the cameraman was then seeing both the creatures. He'd see it. Yeah, he would see the other And the kids. So he was filming Constantly. as he would anything. Exactly. Which is did funny you ever, because... Did you ever consider even in the art elements goggles? Never, never, never. Because for me, eyes, we have to see... Yeah, it was an emotional yeah game. that's what makes it I'm for the TV. Just, yes. And that's yeah. the thing that I, I struggle with. You'd be too. Primarily, fight. Was, we can all agree, fight box is shit telly. But it's the eyeline again, yes. It was the eyeline. It was the eyeline. And the immediate yeah. scene. Well, the, the, audience and, and, the audience in fight box couldn't see it. Yeah, yeah, they just sat there in an empty room. We filled a stadium with people and told them to look over here, look over here. We put <laughs> some tellies on the wall so that their eyeline might be sort of heading towards where we directed them. Yeah. In the end, the audience were almost put in the and background. It, I personally do think that was the genius of the absolute. You know, it's, it's what made it so engaging. It, it's what made it work as TV, and the software is what made it work as an ongoing uh, yeah. engagement uh, for the kids. The, the kids are directly engaging with the digital tweeters that they have to work with. Uh, yeah. And that's really important, especially when it's kids that are taking part as well. When it's, when it's adults, you can almost get a bit more acting involved. But the kids, you need that genuine reaction to things. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't sell it at all. Yeah. We also I had... Uh, there was another one. Oh, oh, it's good to say, I remember the, so the projector that we had um, actually spilled out over the floor as well as the contest table. And... In the uh, in the simulations, we had a, a virtual physical contest table that was the same height as the contest table. But what it meant, you, you, you actually got these really nice uh, situations sometimes where a creature would fall off the contest table and get would still project on the floor, and, it, and the kids would jump back and actually look down at their feet as it would run off. And so yeah. it, that's all added to the you know the, the realism that it was actually happening there. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it had definitely had a certain magic to the show. It, it was something that, I mean, I know me and my friends really liked. And in fact, that's a thing that, um, that I think is quite interesting. Like, what do you all make of the fact that most of those kids that were on the show are now my age and older and have this whole community that they've set up where they've got all these leaderboards and all of that kind of stuff now in their own regard? Like, what, what what's your opinion of that kind of legacy almost that it's sort of installed in these people. Wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, it's just because, I mean, we put, that was a, that was a project of passion, you know, that really was. I mean, we, we and it was, the, it was the passion that really drove it for all of us because we so loved it and so believed in it. And, uh, and I have to say, it was, it's, it was a sort of defining moment in my life. So to, to think that there were kids out there, I mean, it's, some, it's a sort of bit of sweetness in a way because it's so wonderful that it happened, but it's a sadness that in, in that it had to come to an end at some point. And it was also a sadness, I think, that I think you asked a really interesting question earlier, Callum, about the, the power of technology and how that would change things if it was now. I think, and then I think Jeremy mentioned that you could go worldwide because you could obviously distribute it worldwide through the web. But I think that there's, a, there's, a, there's an added component, which was if you did it now, the power of the end user would be more represented than the power of the commissioner. And I think sadly, what we we were hugely lucky because commissioners believed in it. We were hugely unlucky lucky because commissioners stopped believing it. <laughs> and that's the sadness of it. Whereas I think nowadays, if you got that investment from somewhere, there would be such an overwhelming and such a present sense of des desire for it and want for it that there would be then only an idiot would turn around and say, "Well, we have to stop this." I think you'd have something that would run not in perpetuity maybe, but you would have had something that had a longer shelf life because I think you would have had a much more present and visible expression of want. You know, yeah, I think it's, it's a bit little like the Pokemon Go um, thing that came along. I think that's a, uh, whether they were at all influenced by this at all, but uh, that to me was a brand like Pokemon becoming Amziki-ish, basically, and that you could wander around the streets, find your Pokemon collect them, use them in your front room. 
uh, and use them with that tech. And it, it struck me at the time that I didn't know why Pokemon didn't turn that into a TV show. But then the point is they didn't need to mm-hmm. because they'd make all their money out of the users um, interacting in the real world. And, it, and so I think you might be right, there was a window when this could happen. There are lots of weird things though that have happened since. And I mean, you've got to remember when 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 Paul produced all of the stuff and BBC uh, Kings of Warren and all that tech was made available. I don't think. I mean, I I know that the words augmented reality had been put together by Tom Blake back in the early nineties or even late eighties, but nobody talks about AR. That wasn't a thing. It just wasn't a thing. We called it 3D. We thought it was all incredibly proprietary to the BBC. Yeah. We were doing something that just hadn't been seen before, let alone by, I mean, we're doing it in front of millions of kids. I mean, it was the sixth most watched children's program of 2004. I mean, I think the first series came out. There were over a million. Your head there. There. <laughs> yeah, there, were, there, were, there were at least a million downloads of, in the UK, at least, possibly. Um, I'm not sure if that was in year one, but definitely uh, by the end of its time after year three. I mean, that opens up. It was staggering. I, mean, I also just want to mention, I think another piece of genius is the fact that there was so much risk in there that effectively all kind of, or, or whoever the format scheduler was, doubled it, you know, up the ante by two, by saying, okay, you've got to make um, 20 episodes of this in four weeks, or something like that. <laughs> it was ridiculous. So you had kids coming into the studio, doing all of their film, doing all four contests, leaving, and then another whole batch coming in, filming all afternoon to do the whole other show. To do a whole other show and reset and everything. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, these guys were absolute machines. I and mean, I've got to say, Dylan and Guy and um, Dave and whatnot. I mean, they were there, like, they were living in that studio. <laughs> in Enfield. Yeah. No, Elstree, Elstree, not Enfield. Elstree, Elstree. 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 Which Elstree. studio is that? I've often wondered, Paul. Is oh, that the same studio? studio? Is it the one that strictly come down to? I don't know, but I had heard a rumour that it was the one at the Muppet Show. And it was just, it was just, it was, it was about 300, 300 metres from the uh, the EastEnders lot. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Isn't it also where Star Wars is from? I don't know, actually. Mm. Anyway, it was, it, was, it was an incredible time. An I think so. Just to sort of almost justify my involvement in the room to an extent, one of the things that we talked about earlier was that uh, it was an incredible time we were all developing these sorts of shows. And one of the reasons I got to know you guys was A, I lived in Cambridge, and B, I was being told constantly by the BBC that we were in competition with you. Um, and we were being played off against each other constantly <laughs> uh, because we yeah. didn't know each other. And I reached out to you and said, guys, look, we are struggling with this contract, you might think we're the enemy, but I think the BBC might be our enemy, and we ought to get <laughs> together and work out some of this stuff. No, in all due deference, Paul, it it felt like we were fighting this monster all the time to try and get things done and trying to survive as businesses, and yet we were being put off and pitted against each other. Mm. And to me, it was no, look, hang on, we're all developing some really smart shit here, <laughs> and I'd love to meet the guys doing it. Because I remember the first time we hooked up, and it, you were quite wary, especially you, Jeremy. It was like, Has he just come here to steal all our software or coders? Or <laughs> and it turned out I was desperate for some of the answers that you'd worked out because we were involved in a, a similarly monstrous project. The, the, the thing about coders being in the studio, as I recall, that was largely because the BBC had a firewall that we couldn't penetrate with anything more than about 16 megabytes per second of data. So if you wrote code back in Cambridge and tried to send it into the BBC, it couldn't get through the firewall. And you had to have coders sitting there actually writing code in the studio to make things work because you couldn't couldn't actually beam anything in. No, no, I, I, it's just they had no idea concept of why you'd want to send that much data into the building. <laughs> and, and also we'd start the morning, we'd, we'd come in and, and, uh, and Paul would come in and uh, he'd say, I've just had a really good idea for an intro. And then he'd come out with this thing, which our system just doesn't do. And he'd say, it would be great. 
if we had like a city <laughs> full of all the buildings that uh, that kids have submitted onto the website, and then if we took took like the T Rex that some kid has uploaded, and, and the cars and the buses, and yeah. if we had them all driving around in the streets, and then, and then the big Big dinosaur comes along, so I'm walking over. We'll, it's, only, like, it's only a 10 second piece. <laughs> yeah. Three months to write the code for that. Tiny little six. intro. And we'll be like, oh, okay, we'll, work, we'll get to work on that. And then basically, yeah, we'll just like, we'll program that like in the morning and like get all of the assets and put it all out, script it all up. In terms of how things don't change, we, I'm involved in a, a little uh, online show called Zoomlanders, which is about. So using game technology and AR technology to create little animated satires. And the writer on that, we are desperately trying to train him to say, no, no, we can't build a whole new scene just for a 10 second gag. <laughs> we just put a fart gag in. Is that all right? <laughs> but I have to take credit. I did. I programmed it for the space shuttle landing, which is one of my, my, my uh, I don't know if you remember the space shuttle landing, which was one of I think. Which I was very, very proud of, and I actually recorded it in one hit. I couldn't believe it when, I, when the thing actually worked, and we had nothing. And we also had the breakfast making machine. I still have these videos that you saw. Uh, the breakfast making machine, which was fantastic. So, yeah. Wasn't it? That, that was one of the things that always impressed me with the way you showed up to tech. The, the zoops, the, the, the way people put things together in multiples, so they were creating buses and stuff using. Well, that was you know, beautiful because in a way, designed this thing to do. Well, let's. But there's a really good thing there, and a little anecdote here, okay, actually, because what, what was really crucial at the heart of the whole um, the user involvement was the notion that we were giving them a, a toolkit and we were allowing them to make stuff. And we wanted to be kind of, a, quite, I hate the word, authentic, but authentic to their input. And there's a really good story where what we did on the website, we would have these contests where you could submit your creatures to, uh, to see how fast they would run, you know, and then we'd have a high score. And then what was weird was you could download somebody else's creature and make it very slightly better and then resubmit it. So it was kind of sort of a Darwinian uh, evolution that was being uh, created by kids, as it were. So you would download somebody else's, you'd make it better, you'd upload it, and then your name would go in there, but also their name would as well. And then we would have these, these we would get these loops that were getting faster and faster and faster. And one day my production team came in and said, oh my God, we've got a problem. There's a zoop that seems to have just gone unbelievably fast at getting from A to B. I mean, they were sort of incrementally getting better, but suddenly you had this one creature that just went so fast. We were like, okay, let's have a look at it. Let's take a look. And what we discovered was that a kid had just designed a really long, tall zoop. But basically, when it went to start, it just fell over. <laughs> <laughs> when it fell over, and as it hit the finish line, and it, was it was faster than the zoop running. <laughs> and my team said, "Well, we obviously have to we have to ban it because that's wrong." And I said, "No, no. What they've done is they've worked within the rules. We're wrong because we never said they couldn't do that." And yeah. I think that was. I mean, this is 2003, and I think what was so lovely about that was we were starting to understand the relationship between the audience and, and the show and the website is that we couldn't just come in as these sort of bureaucrats and say, no, you can't do this because we hadn't thought about something else. We were the ones who had to be reactive to what the audience was doing. And I think that that sort of, that dance we did with the audience was just fantastic and, and really exciting. And, and it meant then it kept us on our toes. It was all the way through up to production, up to actually studio, because during that time we had kids doing the most amazing things which in itself also evolved the show. So thank you to the fans. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that sort of practice still continues. There's a um, site that they all use called uh, Zook Labs, where they've got these leaderboards with doing speed tests and uh, like high jumping tests and stuff like that. And they've got this leaderboard on there. I checked it out yesterday. Um, one of the people on the Discord said, um, ask them what they think about Zook Labs. And so I checked it out. And um, yeah, it's, it's basically this whole thing that was going on on the website that they've continued doing themselves effectively now. Um, it's quite, it's quite cool to see as well. Software is still available on the BBC website, which is amazing. It is. Amazing. I, it is. I went to find is it. Is it, it really? You can still <laughs> download it now. There's still a fan page, and it looks like it was built in 2001. Hey. Was it but it still exists. Do you have to do? <laughs> I, I thought uh, it, the um, the 
physics license key will be expired by now or something. <laughs> <laughs> you might, I think you might have to probably run it in a virtual machine and set the date back to yeah, 2000. Yeah. There, is, there is quite a lot of virtual machine conversation going on. <laughs> well, I also imagine people have developed the code. I don't know, it'd be another thing to look into to see if anyone's actually hacked the code and done anything with it. Because um, I assume you're not maintaining it. It's, it's out there and it's got a, it's almost, that now has evolved, it's, that's the amazing, beautiful thing, isn't it? You create some software that creates evolving life forms that people play with. And then it goes on and has a life of its own that you guys are probably not aware of for the last eight, nine years. That's actually still happening with creatures. 20 years on. Yeah. Wow. And there are still people doing that. In fact, we get art think, every now and again uh, to, to provide help or <laughs> code or whatever. Or why aren't our servers still running? It's yeah. um, not that uh, not that this should turn into a pitch meeting, but I'm sure Paul's producer um, antenna is going off, going, "Hang on, there's an audience out there that have still been playing with this, <laughs> and developing it for the last twenty years." Maybe we just bring it out like Fight Club and pretend they all hid for 20 years. That, that's something a little bit that they did when they um, when uh, Robot Wars was brought back on uh, Dave or whatever it was brought back on. And they almost developed this backstory that everyone had been still making their robots in secret and doing sort of back alley robot fights and stuff like that. And that was part of the whole story of the new series. You could almost do an eff effectively the same thing with yeah, we could, be the, we could be the Alan Parts of uh, <laughs> uh, TV uh, Futurist Games. Too. I mean, that sort of brings up the almost the demise of the TV show, doesn't it? Which was Bamziki, was it Street Wars that was called it? Uh, Street uh, yeah. Uh, well, what happened, what happened was, yes, unfortunately we didn't get the fourth series with Paul in charge. And Paul also had to leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> For good reason. And, well, just to be so clear, it wasn't that the fourth series wasn't on the card. Do you remember? I mean, it, it, they basically yeah. they, they closed it down, and then I left yeah. the country, not uh, independent of that. And it wasn't yeah. until maybe a year or two later that they stood, maybe a year or so later, they kind of re, re energized well, it. At the time, I think it was longer than that. This maybe, is what yeah. I started doing. Two thousand and nine. Yeah, we were trying to suck the rights back out of the BBC because they decided not to commission it again. And you guys wanted to carry on and do something with it. And we tried to suck out the rights. Well, there's, a, there's a step in between, it. actually, Mike. There's a step in between, which is that actually, when I left the BBC, I left with a contract to work for, 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 for a year. And part of that was to help try and sell uh, it around, around the world. And we did a big tour with BBC Worldwide across the States of pitching it from east to west coast. She's an Apollo. Is she still there? The yeah, time? and yeah. So she was helping us in the states. She's now, now, she's now the president of an organisation called Games for Good. That's right. Yes, that's right. Uh, now I was working with a guy called Steve. Somebody just forgot his we, name. Oh, between you and me, we geeked her out, and now she's the president of an organisation. <laughs> <laughs> so we we we're basically so and that that created a huge amount of interest but a huge amount of fear because I think a lot of people were just terrified that it just felt so huge and unwieldy and we didn't have a very neat package I, I hold myself responsible for that the package we were providing wasn't neat enough to allow uh, people in the states to want to, to, to just buy into it and then what happened was the BBC then suddenly went a bit cold on it and said well we, we're going to give up and that's when I then worked with these guys, Gameware, to say, well, come on, let's see if we can do a, a deal whereby we get the rights and we'll get the back end deal to the BBC. And during that time, we then got a deal with um, uh, Cartoon Network. Who, who, no, Cartoon Network, because it was Adina yeah. who'd been in Nickelodeon, and then she went yeah. to Cartoon, and then she wants it. And then, that, then, funny enough, just at that moment was when the BBC started getting warm again to the idea of doing another series. Well, it was. Course, yeah, because Those two I, things I introduced it to Adina and, and it was at that point where uh, Cartoon Network went to the BBC and said, hey, we're, we're interested in this, can you just tell no, us? No, they went to me. Right. They went to me. That was the thing. However the it worked, was, the they, they were... suddenly the BBC lawyers went, well, hang on, what's this, basically? And we ended up in a fight for our lives to try and get those so... rights. Which is the shame of it, in a way. that it's Which we didn't win. 
Yeah, it's, like, yeah, we did. it's like a lot of TV shows. Uh, that actually, the reason they didn't continue is because some meeting in a room somewhere in New York didn't work out. Which is a shame. Well, we had that global deal on the table. It never happened. It was a, a th- great new yeah. I think it was. I think what was interesting about that whole process was was that actually it it didn't happen because of ironically very good intentions on both parts. To be fair, I think the BBC had very good intentions to be able to run a, a, a fourth series without me as a producer, with a new producer. And because they really wanted to make that new and fantastic, they wanted to be able to do that in the security that they would make something even better uh, and then they could then well, sell that. We, want, we wanted to take the Zooks beyond the studio, out yeah. into the real world. That was the yeah. thing. Yeah. And, and, and that was the sticking yeah. point in, in terms yeah. of the commercial negotiation. Well, uh, the, they they did, the sticking point was they wanted to control the deal. Yeah. Hey, go ahead. I can be independent. Right. Well. I think it's the, your ability to sit between the tech and the needs of tech, and the TV and the needs of the broadcaster, and to translate those two things that made it all work. Basically. And what I saw collapse around this was the inability for the, for the new team that were trying to, as you say, quite rightly expand it and turn it into a bigger thing. But I think in all the wrong ways. They were not listening to the people that, a, the people that played. Ziggs and Love Ziggs still do, and they weren't actually listening to the people that were making it because they thought the people that were making it were TV people. Yeah, so it just, we, yeah, we, 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 we actually developed a sort of a, a bit of a mantra about converged media. Uh, we really wanted to deliver something that was kind of games and television and online, that, that thing that sort of crosses boundaries. Yeah. And um, I remember having a, a discussion with uh, David Braben, who's a, a bit of a sort of an in- games industry legend, um, uh, especially here in Cambridge. And uh, I was talking to him about converged media, and um, and he actually said to me, "Yeah, but I mean, look, did you see that Bamzuki thing on, on television? I mean, that didn't succeed, did it?" <laughs> yeah. Okay, David, <laughs> we did that actually. <laughs> there we are. But I still believe well, that I, there is a huge opportunity in that space. Yeah, I agree with you. I yeah, think there's a, think there's a second wave now with VR, with uh, Oculus Rift and stuff like that becoming a thing. But I think actually that will be the inspiration eventually for the next wave of this sort of integrated stuff. Um, because as we get closer and closer to the fact that you can actually see all of the graphics around you and the worlds that you're creating around. And if you look at how the Mandalorian is being made at the moment, with Instead of green screen, they're actually projecting the entire uh, Star Wars universe around the actors on massive screens behind them so they can see it reflected, interact with it. I think the combination of where technology is currently getting to will get us to a point where we can start doing these And And you can now, um, like you're saying, on your phone, you can do uh, augmented reality um, in real time without the need for any external markers in the environment, it can be the 3D mapping, um, which, you know, in the studio, there was a hell of a lot of uh, infrastructure required to be able to track the cameras in the studio. There were barcodes on the ceiling, every camera had another camera that looked up at the barcodes. That was the problem, I think, with the street idea for about City, wasn't it? That it threw you a massive curveball in terms of how do we track the cameras? Yeah, yeah, and there was a lot of work we put into trying to see how we could do that outside, and um, we didn't. We it was all done back in the studio again, um, because um, the outside stuff was was the desire was to try and get bigger creatures wandering around the streets. Um, um, but uh, to do that uh, with cameras that you could move around is uh, is not not uh, technically feasible. Um, so you'd have to do it with static cameras. But I think um, like now, if you were to do it, you would allow people to be able to watch their own. Uh, contests take place on their phone and um, you know training well, do you think, things that yeah that's really good. I didn't mean to interrupt but do you think that's something that would get over the what was an eyeline problem now in that now seeing a kid staring at the world through a phone is actually normal could you could you televise that no I think I saw no, that I, I wasn't thinking about televising that I was thinking more of that being the show it's more like oh, right. you watch you watch YouTube videos on your phone you'll watch got the show on your phone with but contest taking place on your desk or in the kitchen floor yeah, or something yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah. It's possible. That might not be a bad thing. But it's not really television, is it? 
not good not not TV. It's it's something so, actually something quite interesting that um I've seen recently is the uh the new Mario Kart. I don't know if any of you've yeah. seen that. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, yeah. Around to the group. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of that similar kind of um you know the technology involved in that almost is something that uh is similar in a way um to how Bamzuki could work in a modern climate where you've got the sort of you've got the setup that you would you know, sort of give to people where they'd be able to set up their own Bamzuki arena, effectively. And then something yeah, along those lines where you've got those place markers and stuff like that that help map things for them. And when you've got 3D mapping on your phone, then you could basically make your own assault course by just putting some objects down on the table. You can des design your little um, your zoop thing and basically just see how well it can climb over your pencil case and uh, across the laptop. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so people you know, I think uh, there's a whole different sort of world of sort of like um, competitions and things that you can just do, or playgrounds that you can make for yourself and then um, invite other creatures in and then compete them in your own little I real genuinely, virtual... I genuinely think we should, uh, we should stop this well, conversation. Job, write it all down and pitch it. <laughs> <laughs> <Somebody> like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I suppose, I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, I remember uh, because I... Funnily enough, even though I was a TV director producer, I, I used to get involved in the programming of the content. So I designed content and I used to actually program them using the code that they've written and I had to learn how to do that. And I used to enjoy it so much. I mean, I love making these content and spent hours and hours and hours designing these things. And I really felt that that was a, a branch that we wanted to exploit, we should have exploited, which was world building. And that actually you, you spend ages and ages world building and you just drop creatures into it so that you have. You, you create different tribes of users. And I think, I'm pretty sure, um, this was before Minecraft, and I was saying to them, hey, look, we, we should be doing this as well as, you know, because we have to, and unfortunately, it just, we couldn't, I mean, it just, yeah, well, whatever, you know. But uh, it would have been an amazing space to have got to realize that you had this property, and you could push it in all sorts of directions, and you, what you do is in each space, you, 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 you turn up the screw for whatever it is that that space needs. So if it's televisual, you make it televisual. If it's in your, in your home, you make sure that people can get the best out of it at home. If it's about creating worlds, then you make the best thing for that. But it's all comes down to the same, um, uh, the same brand. And the brand is about um, this real physical looking objects that act in a real physical way combined with stupid creatures that try are trying to get the made to do. And I think that is the essence of Bamzuki. It, it was just that was it. Stupid creatures in a very complex world being That's stupid. Yeah. That's an awful lot like the actual world we're living in right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you so much for all of that guys. It's been really fascinating to hear so much about Bamzuki. It was such a big part of um, my childhood and a lot of other people's out there I'm sure love to hear some of these stories. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. And thanks to the team as well. They're still family. <laughs> <laughs> that was all right. It's great to see them. Yeah, yeah, it was really fa fascinating to find out some of the stuff that went on behind the scenes. I had no idea that a lot of that happened. It, I mean, obviously, I was. It takes more than a village to make a TV show like that. Apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But the, um, I thought it was fascinating that all of them uh, thought that uh, there was still a potential life for something like Bamziki, you know. Um, I think that... there definitely is, to be honest. You know, there's, um, as they were saying, there's such a fan base and everything. I don't see why something couldn't. I mean, not that, not that there's any plans for it, but why not? No. But I'm sure, um, I'm sure Paul or somebody will come up with an idea. Jeremy will probably pitch it. <laughs> anyway, um, listen, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. I'll that was, yeah, some... definitely. Yeah. Next time, call me just because you love me. Yeah, but, you know, this was fun, so. So there we go. There was something a little bit different for you. Another one of those video podcasts, but we thought we'd just change it up a little bit, do it a little bit differently this time around. I hope you enjoyed watching, and if you did, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also, leave a comment below if you found anything fascinating about Bamzuki, and if you wanted to know anything else as well. We can always drop them questions outside as well. Once again, thank you so much and we'll see you next week.